I'm going to tell you the story of how this commission carving came to be. Before that, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Andrew Gable. I've been a stone carver for the last 10 years and an artist for the past 25 years. Even though I studied painting and drawing in art school, I eventually found my way unexpectedly into stone carving and have been selling my work to collectors around the world for the past 10 years. Art is born from various reasons, circumstances, and moments in time, and this one was actually a first for me. Here I'm just giving the stone a quick sand to get a sense of the color patterns and the overall integrity of the stone. This helps me position the subject in the best way possible and avoiding any faults or cracks in the stone and even aligning the color with the subject in a way that I think will enhance the overall piece. Now it's time to lift this 300 pound soapstone boulder onto my carving table. I'd recently sold one of my larger pieces to a collector overseas who was visiting the gallery here in Canada where the carving was located. They connected with the piece and bought it. That's amazing. It had been out of my studio for a few months and I was busy carving a new standing grizzly bear when I received an email from the gallery notifying me of a situation. The carving that the collector had purchased had been damaged during transport. The piece you see me working on here is actually a new commission piece I created to replace the damaged one. You know, I debated whether or not to tell this story, but I wanted to share this dimension to remind myself and everyone listening that business is not perfect, the art creation process is not perfect, life is not perfect, but that should not stop you from moving forward and doing what you want to do. Mistakes happen. Shipping stone artworks all over the world is just part of the process of being an artist, at least my process, and I am grateful for it. Every time I ship a piece, I wonder if it's going to make it, but I can't let that stop me. Risk is part of the game. I could not do it. I could not ship these pieces. I could not do what I needed to do to be an artist, to build an art business, but I wanted to because I've always wanted to be an artist. So this is what I have to do, and I'm going to do it. There's no guarantee that when I complete a piece, it's even going to sell or even going to work out for that matter. But I'd like to be an artist, and so I'm willing to go for it. So right now I'm cutting a nice flat base that will become the bottom of the piece so that it sits nice and flat and balanced. This was a fun moment where I actually get to see if I carved the base flat or not. It was a perfect cut. Good job me. This is also a great opportunity to start getting a sense of the stone and where you can start to see the inside of the stone a bit. Even here, I could start seeing the bold color transitions in this stone, which I was actually a little nervous, yet still excited about, because the piece that inspired this commission was more of a uniform green. This one started giving me the impression that it might be a bit more bold, and that was an understatement. What's interesting about shipping these pieces is that the success rate of work arriving safe and sound is actually in the high 90th percentile. I've been carving work and shipping these pieces for 10 years, and this is actually the first time I've ever had to recarve a piece due to damage incurred during shipping. I would say those are pretty good numbers. If Elon Musk is willing to attempt to ship a rocket into outer space, then I surely must be willing to attempt to ship an artwork across the ocean. You heard me talking in other videos about how I typically start with the head. This is where I am actually establishing the overall size of my subject. There are some key measurements in the head that when extrapolated determine the size of the rest of the body. This one was a bit more tricky because there was a hole in the front of the stone so I had to design my form around this hole and also considering that a cub was going to be sitting on this bear's back. After communicating with the gallery and deciding to move forward with this re-carving commission, one of my first thoughts was, I don't think they have any more stone like this at my suppliers. Commissioning a stone carving is not like commissioning a painting because you're not exactly starting with a blank canvas, you're starting with a stone that already has a history, that already has its own unique color, density, shape, and so forth, which makes each piece highly unique unto itself. I reached out to my supplier who has thousands of stones in his warehouse and his response was, yeah, I might have one. One single stone that matches the specs for this new piece. The stone had to have a bit more height than usual to account for the small cub sitting on top. My experience was like I really had to thread the needle with this one, even though I suspect that it wasn't as precarious as I sometimes feel it is. I really do try and relax through the whole process and remind myself that my carving career, my art career, does not rest on the success or failure of one single piece. And that the point is to simply take daily consistent actions rather than focus on one single piece defining everything. 
I was actually a bit nervous the client wouldn't like the stone because the more I carved it, the more it started to look like the stone was going to be quite a bit different than the original in terms of color. The design itself was working out quite well and matched the original design. I mean, in and as itself, if I didn't compare this stone to the previous stone, the color was absolutely incredible. These pieces really do start to take on a life of their own during the carving process. And whenever I do commission work, I try my best to communicate this to the collector. That for me, as an artist, I don't ever want to try and force a carving to go in a direction that it's not flowing towards. It's so much easier to work with the stone and change change my own ideas rather than attempt to change the intrinsic flow of the stone. That's the balance I do my best to strike, to honor the wishes of the collector, but also honor the creative process that unfolds when I begin a piece of art. My goal is to deliver the best artwork possible, and in my experience, if the stone is going in one direction, I don't want to try and force it in another. I want to work with the stone and bring out the best of the stone and the best of my own expression. To me, this is how I create the best work possible possible. These videos I make are a great way to share my process as an artist and add another layer of value to the viewer and to this world. When I compiled all the footage for this carving process, I ended up with over six hours of video to sort through. I cut that down to about 16 minutes. At this stage, I still do all my own editing and these videos take a lot of time to create, but I always felt a lot of value I experienced as an artist happened during the creative process and it's amazing to have a way to actually get to share that with people. I think art and artists get mystified a lot of the time. Think of the Mona Lisa and Leonardo da Vinci, and how he has become this kind of enigmatic figure with the Mona Lisa taking on a kind of divine, mysterious presence. I love da Vinci, but I also love showing this creative process to demystify the artist so that art and creativity can become a normal and natural part of our reality and part of ourselves. Something that is more accessible to and I'll use the reference that all apparently non-creative people use, making art that is accessible to those who can't even draw a stick man or who don't have a creative bone in their body. If I reflect on how I got to where I did as an artist, it is very heavily based on skill development, particularly when I was young. I just spent a lot of time drawing and creating art. There's really nothing mysterious about it. It's actually quite mechanical. But I think for an artist, for your skill to grow, you also have to create a way to keep doing art. And that has been a challenge in my adult life. So then you have to learn other skills like sales and business or digital marketing, video editing, copywriting, how to build and manage a website and things like that. I'd also say I'm a bit stubborn and have insisted on finding a way to keep doing art, but I'm also okay with not doing it and that's important too. You don't want to be ruled by your passion. Once I got each of the two heads more refined where I could start seeing how these two bodies were going to fit together, I could start taking off a lot of the volume and start roughing in the smaller cub on top and getting a sense of how he was going to be resting on his mother's back. From there I moved down into the mother. This whole piece was actually a bit taller than the original that inspired the commission, but I actually liked that a lot. I feel like the proportions were a bit more accurate. Little did I know when I was creating this work that it would actually be the last piece that I'd do in this studio. I moved into this area 10 years ago for completely unrelated reasons, and in my mind, the idea of being a full-time artist was not something I was thinking about at all. It was actually a dream I'd let go of and was happy to live my life pursuing something else. Unexpectedly, an opportunity crossed my path to start doing these carvings, and once I got my foot in that door, I actually surprised myself with how determined I was and am to make it work, to find a way to build a business and support myself with my art. I was talking with my wife last night about this, actually about how this opportunity was so tailor-made for me, almost eerily perfect. Although I didn't realize it, as I worked on this commission, unbeknownst to me, the winds of change were blowing in. But now, after 10 years in this area and 5 years in this studio, it's time to go. It's time to move, to change, to expand, and it's quite fitting that this mother and cub was the final project for this studio, as it was our son, Phoenix, who is now two and a half, that was a strong driver of this decision to relocate my studio. I keep going back to the face and head because, as I mentioned, that is the kind of starting point for everything else. It's rare that a different part of the carving would be further along than the head. The head is always out front leading the way, and I will continually go back to refine the head, which then leads me to being able to see more specifically how other parts of the body and form should be. This piece was actually a bit stressful to create. That's not good or bad, it's just simply the experience I had as I worked on this piece, and it reminds me of being a parent. As zen as I'd like to think I I am, when you have a toddler running around, it can sometimes challenge your patience and ability to remain calm and collected. I'd say I discovered new levels of stress since being a parent, but also within that have learned to manage and de-escalate that stress. 
For me, as I carved this piece, I had to practice just continuing to walk the process, and even though there were stressful moments throughout, I practiced letting go and just continuing to show up and keep on moving. And you know what? It worked. The piece turned out beautiful, and now I have a reference for next time I encounter stress or doubt as I work on a piece. I know that it can work and turn out amazing because with this piece, I showed myself that it's possible. This stage, you can really start to see those darker, blacker areas of the stone contrasting with the white parts. It was becoming quite obvious that this stone was actually nothing like the other one and had a completely different color pattern. Honestly, I was excited because it looked so dynamic and proved to be a mind-blowing color pattern. In the end, I was so grateful I got the opportunity to create this piece and share this journey with all of you here. Now I'm just continuing to carve out all of the excess stone between the legs. Once you get your leg positions locked in, you begin the long journey of carving out underneath the bear, removing all of the stone that's not going to be there in the end. I'm also shaping this front paw and determining where exactly in the stride I want this bear to be. I'm also considering the overall integrity of the carving. Sometimes this front paw will actually be completely suspended, where other times I will rest a tiny part of it on the ground to help support the weight. Getting towards the end of the carving process, I decided to take a peek at the color, and man, it was so beautiful. I'd carved a few mini bears out of this fusion stone in the past, but I find anytime you carve larger pieces, you get to experience the color more fully. Now I'm getting into the final details of the mother and cub, carving the ears and eyes and face details. This is where I really get to see the personalities of each bear come out. Next, and one of the last things I typically do in the carving process is the paws and claws as well as just making any final adjustments to the forms and cleaning up the seams and basically getting this piece ready to start sanding. Oh right, can't forget the fur details around the head and neck of the bear, which I pretty much always do now. Also, it was a key element in the original carving, so I just wanted to make sure that it was nicely executed in this piece as well. I discovered this small diamond burr that has a slight concave shape to it, which for whatever reason gives it a nice edge to carve lines. I discovered this when I carved the fur details in the life-size polar bear out of Alaskan marble that I carved a few years ago. I literally spent months just carving with this tiny bit on this ginormous polar bear, articulating a beautiful fur pattern. Since then, it's been my go-to for edge work. All right, let's sand. For this piece, I started with a 60 grit, then moved to a 180, then to a 400. I still use this phase of the carving process to refine and shape the bear. There's still a lot of nuances in the form that are determined while I shave off these millimeters with my sanding pads. The smoother it becomes, the more the details and textured areas stand out. Before applying the wax, I'm going to sign the bottom of the piece, which is where I sign, date, and number all of my work. A lot of you have been asking for more details about using the blowtorch and the wax. I will do a more detailed video in the future, but for now you can see here I'm just using the blowtorch to heat the stone and then touch the wax onto the heated stone to melt a thin layer over the entire piece. I typically start at the top and team up with gravity, which pulls the melted wax down the piece. It's fairly straightforward and as you do it more and more you learn to create a nice smooth effect. Parts that appear somewhat opaque after applying the wax will turn out more transparent as it cools. I will let the piece sit for 24 hours for the wax to cool back to its natural state, which is naturally hard. If any of the areas look a bit thick, I will heat that part up and wipe off some of the wax with a rag, which usually works. After it sits 24 hours and I'm satisfied with it, I'll give it a buff with a sponge pad I picked up at the hardware store to create more of a sheen. So there you have it. The piece is complete and I actually received word from the gallery that the client thinks they like the new stone more than the other one. An incredible stone, a great final project for this studio. If you want to follow my journey as an artist, don't forget to like, subscribe, heart, save, share, comment, or stitch, or all of the other things that haven't been invented yet if you see this video in the future. Thanks for being here. Happy creating. Oh, and if you're interested in collecting my original work, feel free to send me a message. See you in the next video.